this train has no brakes, it's teetering off the rails, has it teetered yet fully or not, who knows, but it's coming and the end game is as inevitable as it ever was. This is bullish for Bitcoin. It's a clear advertisement for something that can't be diluted, that can't be censored, that can't be confiscated, that can't be defaulted upon without, without counterparty risk. If a $200 billion bank failure has the ability to take down the entire banking system, then what does that tell you about the fragility of the other banks? If the Fed needs to keep intervening over the next several years and several decades, which I believe is a surefire bet, then it's also a surefire position that you should hold uh, Bitcoin as a significant portion of your portfolio. What's up, Sats fans? Welcome to Swan Signal. My name is Sam Callahan. I am your host today. If you care about your financial future, you need to check out a couple of our offerings, including Swan IRA and Swan Private. Swan Private is our white glove concierge service where you get a trusted partner on your Bitcoin journey. We offer all kinds of education and research projects as well as exclusive events to our Swan Private customers. Check it out today at swan.com slash private. Also, Swan IRA. Swan IRA is the best way to gain exposure to real Bitcoin in a tax advantage account like a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, or rolling over your 401k. So if that interests you, check it out at swan.com slash IRA today. We got a great show for you today. Even in the crazy markets that we've been in over the last year or so, uh, this last week stands out above the rest. Um, we've basically been going through a banking crisis uh, and we've had an emergency Fed response and Treasury response to try to quell the concerns of the markets. Um, I got two guests here that I think are perfect to come on the show to talk about this stuff. Got two analysts. We got Dylan LeClaire from Bitcoin Magazine and Joe Consorti from the Bitcoin Layer. So welcome, you two. Uh, what's going on? Good morning. Morning, Sam. Happy to be here. Uh, got a lot to talk about. Uh, space is as fast moving as ever. So excited for this. Likewise, Sam, yeah, man. thanks What's for up, having Tom? us on. Uh, really excited for the discussion. A lot, lot going on. Uh, you know, second biggest bank failure in U.S. history. Something we were assured after the great financial crisis just couldn't happen, and it happened. So um, really exciting to talk about it. Yeah, our own uh, Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, right? There won't be another financial crisis in her lifetime, but here we are. <laughs> She's at the center of it again. Um, so I wanted to start. Let's Let's take a step back. Um, and start with Silvergate, because for the listeners that may be unaware of what had transpired, you know, Sil Silvergate was one of the primary banks that served the crypto industry, came under a lot of pressure after the FTX collapsed. In fact, Dylan, I remember at Pacific Bitcoin in November, we were kind of talking about where this contagion might spread. And even back then, you know, you were bringing up these banks and, and we were looking at Silvergate, we were looking at Signature. And fast forward to today, and it turns out you were kind of spot on. So maybe uh, we can start with you and you can kind of recap what happened with Silvergate. Yeah, totally. Um, and, you know, like just just to preface this for anyone that's that hasn't, you know, been following the whirlwind of the last, you know, 12, 18 hours, whatever it may be, or I guess the last three days, you know, we had these banking failures over the weekend. There was, you know, talks of mass Armageddon and bank failures uh, the Fed and Treasury came out basically right at 6 p.m. When futures opened last night. We're like all deposits at Silicon Valley Bank, even the uninsured deposits over 250K FDIC uh, are going to be made whole. And oh, by the way, we're shutting down Signature Bank. Um, and so risk asset pumped, uh, risks pumped, uh, equities pumped, uh, bonds pumped, Bitcoin uh, pumped as well. There was, you know, kind of Blipped under 20k uh, as USDC depegged briefly um, on, on Friday and over the weekend, as there was fears of of kind of contagion and a bank run on USDC because they had three billion at, at Silicon Valley Bank. Um, so as all the as all those worries reversed, Bitcoin pumped uh, along with kind of everything else. But I think the real reason why we've been looking at Silvergate Signature, we've written about it a bunch in, in Bitcoin Magazine Pro. Uh, been on the radar since post FTX collapse is like, if you kind of strip back, uh, not the catalyst for the bull market, but I guess like the fiat on ramps of the bull market and how Bitcoin went from, you know, say five to 10 K in 2020 to 60,000. And obviously it's pulled back. Uh, you know, you had, you had the institutional interest, you had the drivers, but really behind the scenes, there was two real banking partners, uh, for the crypto economy. Um, and, and, 
there's there's some more, but right, these were like the big, you know, the big guns, the Sil- Silvergate and Signature. Uh, and it was clear with following FTX debacle that there was, at the very, very least, there was money laundering, AML, KYC policy concerns regarding uh, Send Network and and Silvergate, which are sent, uh, um, Send Network and uh, Signet. Basically, like you could think of them as like off chain stable coins for crypto players at these banks, right? And so these banks, their business models boomed because they were really like, you know, the kind of the only people accepting uh, these clients. And so that, the, the you know, in, in a matter of weeks, Operation Choke Point 2.0 has gone from like kind of a hypothetical thing, rumor, conspiracy to happening in full. Um, and I, I don't think this is the end of it in terms of, you know, Circle as reserves look okay now because, you know, they were made whole, but uh, tr- uh, stable coins have been quasi ruled securities already there's a precedent there and it looks like they're going to continue to kind of look to choke off the bitcoin crypto on off ramps so you know a lot of people like you know everyone's like oh is the bottom in bottom in sure the bottom could be in right Uh, and i think that's that's likely given kind of somewhat of a policy pivot here but the real kind of worry or maybe like last overhang for bitcoin crypto market specifically is the fact that they are purposefully i would i would say uh, and they, as in, you know, the powers that be, uh, the government, uh, the incumbent banking interests are essentially one by one shooting the, uh, the rails, uh, for, you know, on and off to, for crypto players behind the shed. So that's kind of what I'm looking at most here. Um, aside from the initial market impact of, you know, bullish because it's no longer a contagion event and, uh, there's bailouts. That's kind of the, the TLDR of the last, last week for me. Um, but I would love to hear Joe's thoughts and, and yours as well, Sam. Joe, got anything to add to that? Thanks, Dylan. Yeah. So when it comes to, you know, Dylan really hit it right on the head, right? In, in one week, every single every single bank that was, uh, you know, a major crypto on-ramp in terms of US dollar liquidity has been shuttered completely, right? So Silvergate, um, you know, was, uh, was one of the larger players um, and they voluntarily liquidated operations last week. Um, who knows why they began doing that necessarily. But then, you know, very shortly after, it really didn't matter because Silicon Valley Bank, um, you know, obviously serviced uh, a great deal of these uh, crypto firms, but also, uh, you know, tech firms in general, venture capital firms, um, you know, and obviously the uh, the Treasury, the Fed, there's a joint effort there now to uh, essentially, you know, back all uninsured depositors, make sure that as of right now, as of Monday morning, they get all their money back. Um, but, uh, you know, the bank's no longer there, right? The bank's done. And the, the same goes for signature, right? Um, the, the Fed and Treasury are leading a joint effort with the FDIC to make sure that all depositors are made whole, all uninsured, all insured rather depositors are made whole. Um, but by the same token, the bank's no longer around. And so, you know, in this really near term uh, event, how is it impacting markets, you know, on a day to day basis, right? VIX is, you know, exploded higher, right? It hit 31, 32 today. Uh, so it's really above that threshold that, you know, is considered uh, scary, is considered, you know, fear is really re-entered markets. Um, but the, the more concerning thing is the fact that all these, you know, good faith institutions that now want to do business in, in Bitcoin, and obviously crypto is embroiled with that, uh, now they have less of an ability to do so um, as a result of these banking relationships now totally souring. And it's really unfortunate because you have uh, banks like uh, Custodia Bank who are trying to be a fully reserved institution and allow for uh, institutions to on and off ramp to Bitcoin specifically. Um, But they can't get a banking license, whereas you have entities uh, like Silvergate, uh, like SVB, like Signature, who are fractionally reserved institutions. Uh, and are engaging in, you know, uh, highly levered, highly dangerous plays. Uh, and as we found out in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, no hedges whatsoever. Uh, and they can have a banking license galore. And so it, it's really interesting. It's really unfortunate. And I'd say the timing of it uh, seems pretty deliberate. Yeah. Yeah. And Silvergate, um, when you look at their deposit base, it was mostly crypto, right? It was mostly digital asset customers. I think 90% were digital asset customers. So when the price started dropping near the bear market, you know, they're kind of, they lose interest. They start to withdraw funds. Um, then comes the FTX collapse and Silvergate obviously had relationships with FTX, which scared more of these depositors to flee the bank. And Dylan, you brought up like the Silvergate Exchange Network, which is a real-time 
settlement network that these institutions and investors use to do real-time settlement, to make trades with each other. Same thing with Signet, which is the signature version of the Silvergate Exchange Network. These are those two products that they, it, a lot of the industry used, and now they're gone. And so you brought up like, okay, how is this going to affect liquidity? How is this going to affect settlement within the broader crypto industry and like the market structure of the industry as a whole? I mean, what's your take on this? Because, you know, I look at that and I'm just wondering, you know, how are they going to get these digital assets settled now in real time? They'll have to like partner with a bank or somehow fill that void. And what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, so for, for le legitimate players uh, and, you know, there's maybe a spectrum depending on who you are of what you qualify as legitimate or not, but I guess that's another convo. Uh, for the well-regulated, uh, you know, compliant players, like uh, as much flack as they get, Coinbase being a publicly traded company goes through a much more rigorous test than some offshore buck chop exchange, which, you know, we don't even have to name, uh, you know, audits, financial statements, quarterlies, Etc. Right, um, and so they like Coinbase won't have. A tr I, I don't think Coinbase, or the Coinbases of the world, which there are very few um, that are kind of have as as tight of a of a belt for you know a crypto conglomerate as a, as a Coinbase does. I don't think they'll have a, a problem getting a banking relationship. Maybe they will, in which case everyone else will have a really really hard time. But the small scrappy crypto startup, uh, you know, the offshore kind of. Um, offshore crypto firm that has, you know, doesn't really have a true domain or has, you know, kind of has a bunch of shell companies, right? Like a lot of these big, big exchange players, and you can look at just the signature banking client list, like they were banking with signature and or Silvergate, uh, if not directly, then with shell companies through 2020, 2021, 2022. Uh, that's over now. Um, so I think the, the most immediate thing is like weekend liquidity is going to go way down. Uh, there's this interesting dichotomy with Bitcoin currently as an asset being, depending on the metric you look at, the most tightly held that's ever been. Um, and, and you can look at a bunch of different metrics. Like if, if you just look at a simple one, like the one year Bitcoin held for over a year, right? All time high. So like the circulating supply float is, is as tight as ever at the same time that on off ramp access has been dramatically cut off and it's not completely cut off, um, but relatively compared to where it was. So so a billion dollars in either direction here. If you had a you know a billion of dry powder and you wanted to sell, or you had a billion dollars worth of big, uh, a billion of dry powder to deploy, or you had a billion of Bitcoin to you know sell and get liquid, that's going to move. <laughs> it's going to move the market here. Um, so it's just I think it's it's just an interesting place. Uh, Bitcoin's still you know sixty percent from the highs. People, a lot of people are saying it's dead. Meanwhile, the fundamentals under the surface are super, super strong. Uh, you're going to have, I think, banking troubles and, and, and increasing in compliance uh, and SEC guidance come forward in regards to the crypto industry uh, in general. Not so much like the Bitcoin stuff, but a lot of the crypto adjacent securities fraud stuff, I think, is really beginning to to bubble up. I'm not saying I'm a fan or not of the SEC. I just I think that's it, that's just what it is. Um, and so I think that's that's going to be the story here for the crypto a, a crypto economy per se over the next 12 maybe maybe the rest of 2023 into 2024 is okay there's obviously a real incentive for the legacy guys to come in here and and, and i believe bitcoin's here to stay i think you guys do as well the people that do uh, also believe bitcoin has long-term staying power okay then what did those incumbent interests with the legacy system look like because you know for better or worse, we're not going to transition to Bitcoin as a unit of account tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, settlement all on Bitcoin, denomination of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a store of value. Like it is a process for a lot of people. I know there's like Bitcoiners that have already made that transition, but for, for you know, players that are making that transition, you know, incumbent interests that have been kind of in this fiat game for decades, centuries, uh, it takes time, right? And so those rails are really important. And I think the Black Rocks of the world, the JP Morgans of the world, um, you know, the, the globe, the systematically important banking relationships, they, they, they want a piece of the stable coin game when rates are at 4%, right? Rates aren't at zero anymore. These are like lucrative. These rails are pretty lucrative. And so I think by the time we get to the halving in 2024, we're going to see a completely revamped, uh, and probably much more, you know, compliant top down, uh, banking, banking relationship, right? Where the, it's not Sen, yeah. it's not Silvergate. It's not signature, right? It's the it's the guys that have been in the game for a while that are banking with Bitcoin companies. Yeah, 
I mean, it seems like they're they're taking those little crypto banks back behind the tool shed and shooting them in the head, to be honest with you. I mean, Signature Bank yep. specifically is one of the things that really confused me why they shut it down, because I felt like they were different than Silvergate. They were a little bit larger. They had a more diverse deposit base. Um, they had a pretty strong loan book. I mean, Signature's board member came out and said, I think that if we'd been allowed to open tomorrow, that we could have continued. Um, but they were shut down. And so, I mean, you brought up Operation Choke Point 2.0. Um, many are arguing that this is an attack on, on the banks that serve crypto industry to basically give their infrastructure and their products over to those incumbent <laughs> banks, JP Morgans of the world, the, the Wells Fargo's of the world. Uh, Joe, do you sympathize with that view? What do you think is going on there with Signature? I do. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Dylan was spot on really when, uh, and you were spot on, Sam, when you said that basically all these small crypto banks are being taken out behind the shed. Really, I think a lot of this stems from after uh, uh, 2022, what happened during that entire year. It now is really the time after all of these firms have totally collapsed uh, for one reason or another to uh, for all of the relevant agencies uh, to come in uh, and, and talk about consumer protection uh, and, and all those other things. And so it's sort of a double bladed sword in that. It, for the for you know in the short term it removes all of that big money liquidity that may want to participate in in Bitcoin and crypto, uh, but in the long term you know you are making for an environment where these scams can't happen again. Uh, but you know in, in that process there are a couple of um, uh, things that you, you maybe muddle the line between doing something justifiably and not doing something justifiably. I think Signature um, the fallout from Silvergate uh, collapsing as well as basically everything that's happening right now, right? The, the risks that are posed uh, from a bank like Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapsing and its creditors not being made whole um, are, are smaller regional banks, right? You know, it's not the JP Morgans of the world, the big four, the, the city groups of the world that are going to be threatened by uh, a bank like Silicon Valley Bank uh, going under uh, or a bank like Silvergate going under. It is the signature banks of the world. And so I think uh, the SC, uh, rather the the FDIC, the Fed, the Treasury, um, they were getting out ahead of uh, something that could have happened with Signature. Um, but that told that said exactly like you said, right? They had uh, a better asset mix on their books. Um, they had uh, a strong, a much stronger loan book. Um, you know, if you if you take a look at the, the financials that they have gone ahead and released, um, uh, and it's really really strange that they made a systemic risk exception. Well, that's what it's called for Signature Bank. Um, that's the reason they shut down Signature. It's also the reason they shut down Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, it, it's really strange. And one thing it tells me is that the strength of the, the banking system specifically uh, may be more fickle than was previously advertised. Following 2008, obviously, uh, Basel III, uh, you know, uh, the, the idea is that banks have to hold uh, uh, high quality, safe and liquid assets uh, to a certain ratio of what they have in their books. And so the idea was that, you know, there's no way that banks can face liquidity issues or solvency issues anymore. They're holding this high quality collateral and they have to hold it in really high quantity. Um, but after the failure of SVB, it's like, wait a minute. Uh, they had uh, an extremely high, uh, large amount of U.S. treasuries in their book, that safe and liquid collateral that you've spoken about so much. And so if a $200 billion bank failure has the ability to take down the entire banking system, then what does that tell you about the fragility of the other banks who are holding much more of this pristine collateral on their books, right? Uh, obviously, in the case of Sil uh, Silicon Valley Bank, they didn't have interest rate hedges in place, um, which is the silliest thing ever, right? If your portfolio composition is not diversified and it's exclusively in really highly interest rate sensitive uh, treasuries, right, on the longer end of the curve and mortgage-backed securities, which are even more interest rate sensitive, and you don't have any hedges in place, you're really asking for it. And um, you know that's why it, it faced a really, really high amount of damage. But if the Fed and the Treasury and the FDIC all agree that they have to step in, right? They make what's called a systemic risk exception, i.e., if Silvergate, uh, if Silicon Valley goes under, if Signature Bank goes under, then it poses systemic risk to the U.S. banking system. Uh, that shows you just how interconnected and, 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 and fragile the banking system is. And uh, you know, I would, I would be on the lookout certainly for other regional bank failures. I know First Republic. Uh, is uh, is is under watch right now. It's kind of ironic. Uh, down the street, not down the street from me, a town over uh, from me. First Republic Bank is right across the street from Silicon Valley Bank, which is really unfortunate. Oh, wow. um, so there's going to be a lot of cars parked on that street today. That's for sure. Uh, people trying to get their money out. But um, 
it's really remarkable and it's it's telling about the fragility of the banking system yeah man yeah silicon valley bank like you said the second largest bank failure in history happened in a matter of days um this this is different than the niche smaller crypto bank silvergate you know this was a large bank as a corporate bank served vcs startups tech companies like shopify roku teladoc um there's a lot of blame to go around and some people are blaming the fed for jacking interest rates so high so fast some are blaming uh silicon valley bank itself for poor risk management some are blaming all these vcs for going on twitter and just inciting a bank run you know, maybe like, let's talk about a little bit about that maturity mismatch. And because that's one similarity between all these banks, uh, between Silvergate, uh, Signature, Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and then maybe wh who are you guys blaming? Like, who do you think is the main culprit here? Because like I said, a lot of people are like blaming him and her and everyone for what happened. But um, I want to hear what your thoughts are, Dylan. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a classic classic duration mismatch, you know, the, the banking bros will say, you know, it was not a solvency thing. It's just liquidity. Uh, you know, if we, if they didn't, no one withdrew for 30 years or 10 years or whatever, then the bank would have been, would have been fine. Uh, it's just interesting that, you know, these, these, these uh, policies came out now, uh, or I guess as of, you know, last night at 6 PM, uh, and if they existed last, last Wednesday, last, last Monday, you know, whatever, last week, Silicon Valley bank would be a $300 stock. Right, like, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's a quasi, it's a quasi pivot, uh, not a full pivot. Uh, I kind of think this is a, you know, potential like Bear Stearns type moment where, you know, they, they got the $25 billion fund. They said, you know, we're going to backstop whatever. And that meanwhile, you have all these banks kind of, uh, flailing around now, uh, it's really a securities facility. If you have an illiquid loan book, it's not, there's not much help. Um, so yeah, I, like, you know, who knows what the next thing to break is, but this was the entire, you know, the entire, like people are saying, Oh, you know, Bitcoiners talking about the macro, the macro gurus, the macro guys. It's like, well, no, it's like, you can kind of almost left bell curve this and say like bad things happen during a policy tightening. <laughs> and what are those bad things and how, how do they break? Like, we don't really know. Is it a banking system liquidity thing? Is it, you know, what happened in the UK guilt market, you know, with, with pensions being levered to the hilt with their long bonds as collateral, right? Like I, I am not in the, in the weeds tuned in off floor of these investment banks and, and whatever else. But I do know that like, yeah, problems arise when the global risk, you know, risk-free reserve asset, the long bond draws down by 30%, like an historic drawdown, like bad things happen. <laughs> and so we're seeing that. Um, I don't think we've seen the full pendulum shift to like, oh shit, we really broke things. Uh, but I think it's telling that, you know, two years and like the, the short end of the yield curve and really the entire bond market is getting bid today. Yields are down across the curve uh, and equities are, are struggling and volatility is way up, right? There's, there's you know, kind of like a, a, a volatility a VAR shock, value at risk shock here today. And so... Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. You know, I think this is going to ignite the animal spirits. Certainly this doesn't help what would have helped inflation. Uh, and I'm not saying that there shouldn't have been a bailout there or there should have been, it just happened, right? Like the Austrian in me is say it's no bailouts ever. The Keynesian or the, per, you know, the, not the Keynesian in me, but the person in me that understands how the Keynesian system works knew there was going to be bailouts coming. Uh, but what would have helped, you know, get the inflation down, you know, Silicon Valley's free money spigot, taking a, a free market hit would have, would have surely helped, right? This is going to, in a, you know, in a way really reignite the animal spirits, you know, don't, don't get me started on like what a hot CPI print does to, to the market in the next month. Well, tomorrow, the next, you know, the next couple quarters. Um, Cause I don't think inflation barring like economic Armageddon and that CPI, that PCE, whatever their gauge is, isn't going to go back to 2% year over year uh, in these conditions. So that inflation fight is going to be an ongoing battle and, and whether the, the Fed now prioritizes, you know, the financial stability aspect of it um, and ignores the inflation is going to be something to be seen um, because this is kind of like what they didn't want is for Powell to become, you know, the Arthur Burns of yesteryear and capitulate early and let inflation really rip. Uh, and, and, you know, because this is going to, this is going to hurt everyday people. There are no good choices. There's only trade-offs. Uh, with with monetary policy this far this far gone right with, you know they're so far down this this path of 
zero interest rates and QE and everything bubble uh, asset valuations that during the unwind, there's a whole lot of ugly choices and, and not really any you know good policy. Uh, e- either way, there's probably going to be some form of error. Mm-hmm. So we're just going to see it play out. And the, and the exciting thing or interesting thing is like as a Bitcoin analyst, right? We can say, oh, you know, th- there's no bailouts and every other oh, the depositors lost their money. This is bullish for Bitcoin. And it's a, it's a narrative reinforcement. Uh, and on the flip side, it's like, oh, <laughs> they bailed everyone out again and they made everybody whole and the Treasury and Fed are backstopping it. This is why we Bitcoin. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's like either way, it's like a clear it's a clear advertisement for something that can't be diluted, that can't be censored, that can't be confiscated, that can't be defaulted upon without without counterparty risk. So, yeah, I mean, it's just an education process and a whole lot of orange pills were doled out over the last week in my estimation. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Joe, what about you, man? Who who do you blame or who do you think should be blamed for some of these bank collapses? Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's, going? A, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of blame to go around, frankly. Um, but but just as Dylan said, right, you know, we, we witnessed last year the most aggressive tightening cycle in the history of the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, they, they raised their policy rate, they influenced other short term rates up faster, uh, more aggressive at a more aggressive pace than ever before. And, uh, you know, we've, we've seen the fallout of that sort of in the uh, domino effect of what's more interest rate sensitive, uh, you know, domino of most interest rate sensitive, and, and then it sort of goes down. And, um, you know, at the beginning of last year, it was no surprise that within, you know, just a few months of uh, the initial rate hike uh, in, in March that you saw Terra Luna completely implode. Right, perhaps the most fickle uh, of all financial instruments available, uh, the Ponzi scheme exploded, and then shortly after that, you had Celsius, and then FTX, uh, and so you know these crypto firms started falling uh, apart, and then you start to see uh, Q4 into Q1 of this year, over the last several months, that tech firms are laying off employees, right? Uh, and now you unfortunately see the banks that service those tech firms and service those crypto giants uh, go under, and so really, it's no surprise that this occurred. Um, things are bound to break. Credit events are bound to occur, um, you know, during really, really aggressive policy tightening. And this is no exception. Uh, I'll say, you know, in terms of blame, um, I think it, you know, it, chances are it falls a little bit more on Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, they made a few uh, extremely critical errors. The first one, uh, obviously, they had a very, very large securities portfolio uh, relative to uh, their entire asset base. So uh, over the last uh, year, obviously, as activity has slowed down in, in venture capital, um, they haven't been able to write as many loans as they generally would. Uh, and so as such, they have capital to deploy rather than sitting in cash or doing something savvy like taking a look at the front end of the curve, maybe diversifying your treasury holdings a little bit, buying some that don't have much duration risk at the front end that are offering more than the long end. Um, you know, they decided to continue beefing up their holdings of long end US treasuries. Uh, and so they had, I believe, a uh, 40 something billion uh, dollar holding of uh, treasury security. Oh, rather, $26 billion um, worth of treasuries. Uh, and uh, all told, they had $91 billion worth of really, really high interest rate sensitive securities for a total uh, securities portfolio of $120 billion. Uh, now, this is for a bank of $212 billion worth of total assets. And so the majority of what it had was a securities portfolio. So that is strange relative to other banks. Um, generally speaking, you have a loan book that is much larger uh, than your securities portfolio. Uh, and not only that, but the securities portfolio wasn't diversified. So the securities portfolio was in all, it, 100% of it was in very, very uh, interest rate sensitive instruments. So we're talking uh, long end treasuries, right? As uh, interest rates go up, as they did very aggressively last year, the long end of the curve, the price falls much faster. And they were holding a lot of those. Uh, they were holding a lot of mortgage backed securities. Uh, which are, of course, interest rate sensitive. As rates go up, borrowers have less of a likelihood to pay. The value of those mortgage-backed securities drops as cash flows from mortgages also drops. And so they they really got completely hammered on interest rate risk. Uh, they reported... Uh, so, th- so that's A. B, uh, the, the blame for Silicon Valley Bank, is they didn't have any hedges in place whatsoever. If you take a look at their... Uh, and this is something that was uh, released by FedGuy12 on Twitter. He posted about this. 
Um, but in terms of interest rate contracts, right, derivatives to, to sort of hedge out that interest rate risk, they had no futures, no forwards, no swaps, no swap options, no forward rate agreements, actual zero, zero dollars and zero cents worth of contracts for any hedging instrument whatsoever, uh, which is pretty insane, right? If you're a risk management department, what is your job and what are you doing if not for that? And so that's that's issue B. Um, you know, they were they were not diversified. They had very, very high interest rate sensitive instruments on their books and they had no hedges in place. Okay, that's not all that bad as long as the public doesn't know about it. What happens? Well, uh, on Tuesday, they reported this $1.8 billion, uh, $1.8 billion loss after they sold uh, some of their treasuries, some of their securities to shore up some cash. And then on that same day, uh, SVB Financial Group, the holding company of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, announced a capital raise, right? So, you know, it's all fine as long as the public doesn't know about it, right? If we're a bank and we have a, we have a duration mismatch, we're borrowing short, we're lending long, we suddenly have a huge shortage of people uh, 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 who uh, we can borrow from, right? Depositors are fleeing. Uh, you know, as long as the public doesn't know about it, we're fine. But they announced a capital raise. And so what did that do? It sparked a huge run on depositors uh, fleeing for the exits. And now, uh, you know, it really exacerbated the issue. And on Wednesday alone, SVB faced an outflow of $42 billion, which was about a quarter of their $173 billion deposit base. And so um, obviously, they were put in a really fickle situation throughout all of last year, in that what they were holding was, you know, this, this, Hot potato that was just melting uh, their hands, and they were holding onto it without any hedges. Um, uh, you know, and, and uh, really poor risk management uh, really led to their demise. It was it was this uh, sort of confluence of all of these different factors uh, that allowed yeah. for this to occur. Yeah, I mean, they basically bought the top of the bond market. <laughs> um, the the Fed the Fed was saying that it was transitory. So, I mean, I guess they believed the Fed that there was going to be inflation. They wouldn't go on a crazy rate hiking cycle. They bought the top of the bond market. And, and I'm looking at the Fed and Silicon Valley Bank specifically, if you look at their depositors, it's all these VCs. It's all these like nonsensical SPACs and, you know, bullshit startups, essentially. Um, th their deposits quadrupled from 2019 to 2022. And so they were driven by the low interest rate environment that the Fed created, all that QE, all that fiscal bailout money had to go somewhere. It flowed into the Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and then these VCs, once once they got wind of what Joe was just talking about, they started telling all their startups, like Union Square Ventures, you had Peter Thiel going out saying, take your money out, and basically cause this bank run. And then they turn around and and they say, hey, we, we, we need a bailout. Like, this is going to be critical. This is going to be systemic. And they kind of got it. But you know, I look at these VCs and I'm like, this is exactly, if you're an Austrian econom economist, you're looking at this and you're like, this is the creative destruction that we need right now. We need to clear out these, these VCs that are just sloshing this money around and all these unprofitable companies. But now we come back and we bail them out. So, you know, it's hard for me to feel like, like, why did, why did they do this? Like, did you guys think this was actually systemic? Like I look at this Silicon Valley bank and I see it as kind of like an outlier bank that they came in and saved when they should have let it go. That's exactly what we kind of need as a society, as a, as a, uh, to grow up, have a more stable, healthy economy. But here we are again, you know, bailing out things. So Dylan, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, uh, we actually had a talk with Odell in January, uh, in Nashville in person. And, and we were talking about, I'm actually surprised how much, how, how much Odell was talking macro, uh, and and he was and he was literally being like, so we're gonna get some bank runs, aren't we? And I was like, well, I mean, I don't know, Adele. I don't. I wouldn't say that. It's a it's a felony to incite a bank run. He's like, no, I'm not inciting one. It's just it's just obvious where this like social media age is gonna come from. And when confidence is a fickle thing, and you know all these banks are are levered up, and you know the FDIC doesn't have any money, and they're talking about bail-ins because there was like a pretty viral clip I posted, uh, the FDIC yeah. saying, hey, there's gonna these guys have to know there's gonna be bail-ins. Um, so, you know, the FDIC 250K threshold, essentially becoming a quasi infinity threshold for, uh, you know, upper tier banks. Like, I, I suspect there will be more banking contagion and there will be one or two small, small regional banks. Maybe they're not even publicly traded. Maybe they're private or whatever that the FDIC says, oh, nope, sorry, guys, uninsured depositors, you're going to get rugged. You know, to try to take a bold stance and that's going to probably, probably blow up in their face. Um, 
but like, I, I don't know exactly how that direction goes down, but there's a clear message here to, to everybody. It's that, you know, and like Biden saying it, right? Like they're just rewriting the rules as we go. You know, never mind this fractional reserve thing. We're just, we're just going to fully guarantee it all. Um, and that's, you know, <laughs> anything but deflationary, anything but disinflationary. Um, because in an in a actual, you know, legitimate monetary system, whether it's built on gold or fiat, right? Money is created through lending, um, especially fractional reserve lending. It's destroyed through debt to payment or default. Uh, and when you see a mass withdrawal um, and, you know, a dash to get liquid from these banks and, you know, they have to liquid, liquidate their long duration holdings or their, their loan book uh, and they have to pay everybody out, like that's money supply, especially if they go bust, that's money supply that goes poof and is destroyed. Um, and so by, that, by them backstopping it, they're saying, no, we're not letting that credit contraction happen. Um, which is, I guess, what you would expect in an interventionist fiat, fiat uh, monetary regime, right? That's this is always the end game. Um, you know, whether it's to this extent or much, much bigger, um, this is this is what happens during tightening cycles. This is what happens during recessions. Um, even though I guess we're not technically in a recession, uh, and and the ultimate outcome of any fiat uh, credit boom, or not even fiat credit boom, but any any Keynesian economic credit boom is a subsequent bust. Um, and that and that bust comes in a multitude of forms and factors. Uh, but this is just one of those symptoms, right? Is is a run on the banks and a collapse of circulation credit. And, th- and by them intervening uh, with the treasury facility, with a, you know, a backstop for these duration programs, anybody can go up and s- to, to the Fed and get and get uh, and post their bonds collateral at par, right? So imagine how nice it would be to go collateralize your Bitcoin at 69K, right? Obviously, that's a different example. It's it's a bond that was, you know, bought at $100 or, you know, won, won 100 pennies on the dollar at coupon that has fallen because of the duration component. There's a lot of, you know, bond math and intricacy there. But essentially, uh, the longer the instrument, as Joe said earlier, uh, as yields go up, the price goes down. The price goes down the most in the longest duration. Um, so these guys had mark to market. Uh, unrealized losses that they won't have to realize uh, under this sort of under a facility like this. And it's, it's only one year supposedly, but this is just another one of those things that I think in, in hindsight is like, you know, you check the box and it was just, it was, it was uh, not a policy shift or regime change, but it was Pandora's box was somewhat opened, right? Similar to the start of QE tarp, all this stuff. It's goes, okay, well now you can just buy whatever, um, and you'll never have to actually realize these losses. Um, your gains will be privatized. Your losses will be quasi socialized mm-hmm. in the form of uh, the Fed balance sheet expanding or the Treasury um, bailing out depositors. So, you know, it's a great thing to have a banking license. You, me, uh, none of us can have them. Uh, but for the people that do, right, this is like, this is great. You know, the guys at JP Morgan are laughing in their boardroom today saying because they're getting an influx of depositors and they can't lose. Um, so yeah, I, this is, uh, this is obviously, uh, an implicit advertisement for something that can't be corrupted. Um, and I, I suspect that this, uh, you know, this pivot of sorts is going to come in a much, much bigger magnitude at some point in the future. Um, cause I very rarely the first kind of their first, uh, inflection point or their first kind of, okay, we'll, we'll pause, we'll, we'll back it up a little bit. We'll lower the intensity of this cycle, this tightening cycle. Very rarely does that like quell all the panic, all the madness, all of the the market illiquidity and chaos. Um, so who knows? Like I'm not saying, you know, JP Morgan's gonna go under, although Jim Cramer did tweet it, but uh, you know, I, I <laughs> wouldn't I wouldn't be uh very surprised at all if there's, you know, we still got six, twelve, eighteen months of of wonkiness in the real and the financial economy. Uh, these things don't happen smoothly. But that that could be wrong. That's just my two cents. Yeah. Jim Cramer also said Silicon Valley Bank was a buy. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's a national treasure, man. I honestly shield the top. Um shield the top. Um, but like in terms of the like I just want to go over the response. You know, they made all they supported all unsecured depositors. So anyone who had funds over the 250k cap, um, they're now saying they're fully covered, right? They're gonna get all their money back. Um, and then the new emergency Fed facility provides liquidity for banks that come under similar pressure, the bank term funding program. It's just another acronym they came out with. Um, and, and like you said, it, it provides loans that, 
basically un undersecured and cheap loans. They can take their bonds that are underwater, like Joe was saying, that had suffered from all this interest rate risk and use them as collateral with the Fed value of valuing them at par. And that's kind of the bailout, if you will. Uh, you know, there's no fees, there's no prepayment penalties associated with these loans. Any of these banks that now have underwater bonds, if they ever come into under pressure where depositors want to withdraw their funds, they can go to this facility and say, hey, we need a loan. And they, they can give their underwater bonds to them and they'll get that uh, loan with the collateral at par. So, a lot of people are arguing though, because they're saying, well, this isn't a bailout because you know the equity shareholders were wiped out, the bondholders were wiped out. And so, Joe, do you consider this a bailout? And because they're saying taxpayers won't pay for it too. And that's the big argument right now. Yeah. So I tweeted yesterday, this is QE5. This is QE5. And people uh, in my comment section, you know, they may take me as financially illiterate for saying that, but I want to explain why I'm saying it's QE5 somewhat in jest, but I do agree with you that it's a bailout. The Fed does repo operations all the time, right? The Fed has a standing repo facility. Um, you know, th they take in treasury collateral all the time uh, and they pay out cash, right? They do this all the time. They do this on overnight, uh, uh, you know, overnight with their standing repo facility and their reverse repo facility, right? When you move in the inverse direction, uh, you can park excess cash, you get a treasury in return, then they buy that treasury back for you at the next day for a slightly higher price. But the, the difference with this is that this is not a normal repo operation whereby a bank puts up treasuries as collateral and can receive cash uh, in, 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 in a short-term loan. Uh, this new emergency discount window, uh, essentially, you can take your distressed collateral, right? So collateral that uh, is deeply discounted, um, right? All these treasury securities, all these banks that have unrealized losses over the last uh, 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 year from obviously the worst year for treasuries ever, uh, I believe, and they can bring them to the Fed and redeem them at par. And so you're creating dollars where there weren't dollars before. You're essentially, you're flooding the, you're flooding new uh, new value into the system, right? And enable enabling more credit creation uh, on behalf of these banks, which is inflationary, right? Um, you know, by by uh, lending against these deeply discounted assets at par, right? I go to you know, I'm J.P. Morgan. I go to the Fed uh, with my 30 year long bond trading at uh, 50 cents in the dollar, and I borrow one dollar against that, right? And so all of a sudden, um, I no longer have. That discounted asset, I now have what what was uh, two times the value of that asset on my books, and I can go out and create credit to the tune of that. Um, and so it's it's that's a bailout. It's essentially a bailout, you know, through essentially removing uh, and making all of the requirements to go to the Fed's discount window extremely lenient, and then also saying that hey, we will lend against all of your collateral at par rather than saying we'll lend against, lend against your collateral, um, you know, plus uh, 5%, plus 10% or at, at market price. Um, that's basically a bailout because you're introducing new value into the system where there wasn't any value before. And frankly, this is the most nonsensical Fed response for a Fed that has played it pretty intelligently throughout this whole cycle. And I'll, I'll say that I'll give Fed uh, the Fed credit, right? They've, they've stuck to their guns. And they've effectively managed expectations ahead of time. This is one of the most nonsensical things that they've done, right? Through not allowing this creative destruction, as you as you put it, Sam, and as Austrian economists put it, to play out, um, they're they're essentially letting this poorly allocated capital proliferate. Um, they're kicking the eventuality of uh, having these individuals default down the road and saying that it would be systemically disrupted if they di disruptive if they uh, defaulted. Um, which seems patently false, right? If Silicon Valley Bank was as small as it was, um, and it had an extremely small loan book, remember, um, you know, they had a very, very large securities portfolio relative to their loan book. Um, if they defaulted on their loan book as the 18th largest bank uh, with an extremely small uh, amount of loans outstanding, I don't think that would have been systemically disruptive. I think this was the Fed, uh, you know, this was a Fed who made uh, a huge policy error here. And I think that, uh, you know, the reason you see uh, Treasury is getting bid up so hard, particularly on the front end, is because people are saying, "Look, this was this was you know indicative. You you guys are done here. You guys blinked. Um, you know it doesn't seem as of right now that it, and and what what this essentially did was it it showed that the Fed is fearful, and that's not what you want as an individual. The reason the Fed has been so successful this cycle 
in what it, it intends to do, which is wind down its balance sheet, remove bank reserves from the system, while also hiking its policy rate. The reason it's been so successful is because the public has seen the Fed as being in control and having its hand on the steering wheel. And with its emergency actions yesterday, that in my opinion, didn't need to happen, uh, it shows to the public, um, to the rates market, and, and to every single market, that the Fed perhaps wasn't as in control as was previously suspect suspected. There's a little bit of fear on behalf of the Fed. And therefore, it's going to have a tough time transmitting policy. And it's going to have a tough time being taken seriously if at the March meeting, it says we're going to continue being tight with policy. Because you basically just caught, you just showed that you were bluffing uh, and indicated that there was uh, you know, what you believed systemic credit risk in the system, which I don't feel that there was. I think this was a systemic policy error. And because you know, the, the Fed's response is, of course, redeeming this distress collateral at par, that's essentially uh, you know, uh, introducing new value into the system. That's a bailout, right? Whatever way you want to call it. And that's why on Twitter, despite it not being entirely accurate, I called it QE5. <laughs> Yeah, and it kind of rubs me the wrong way when they say taxpayers won't pay for it because, um, you know, although it's almost like a bailout from big banks to small banks in a way, um, and the fund, the fund is going to the depositors, but it's paid by these U.S. banks, but it's ultimately backstopped by the Treasury Exchange Stability Fund, Stabilization Fund, and, and therefore the U.S. taxpayers. And the Fed facility... You know, it's going to exchange all this underwater bonds, all this paper at par with no penalty, and it's all going to go on their balance sheet, right? That's what Dylan was just talking about. All those losses are now on the Fed's balance sheet. So, you know, the taxpayer will pay for it ultimately, uh, but they're saying, hey, this isn't the global financial crisis. We're not bailing out equity holders. We're not bailing out bond holders. You know, these are depositors. But, you know, the same thing, it always goes back to the taxpayer and um, it's not right, you know, in my opinion. And and I, I agree with you, Joe. I don't know if it would have been systemic, but that's what they're saying. And that's how they're getting away with it. Right? It's pretty remarkable because um, allowing this particular bank to fail, just to interject, it would have helped them in what they're trying to achieve. What has the Fed said since day one, right? What has Jerome Powell been upset with? He's been upset with the fact that you can bid monkey JPEGs, that these things are trading uh, 1,000x over the weekend, right? He's upset at all of this poorly allocated capital. And so allowing a bank to fail that services VCs and services tech firms and services these crypto firms, allowing that bank to fail, that helps the Fed in its policy mission to vaporize this poorly allocated capital. So allowing it to fail, it goes with the Fed's mission, but for whatever reason, the Fed decided to blink, the Fed decided to bail them out. And so that just makes it all the more yeah. silly. Yeah, man, you're exactly right, man. I agree completely. And um, it's it's interesting, too, because there's some thoughts around the fact that this facility, now that they basically removed interest rate risk for all these banks, right? I mean, is this really a way for them to continue raising rates higher, do you think? Like, they basically get away with it because, like, all right, we're not going to blow up these banks because we have this you know, facility now in place, and they can just always redeem, get those bonds valued at par, no matter how high we jack rates, so we can keep fighting inflation. Do you guys sympathize with that view at all? There's a couple interesting takeaways. Um, the first is is that I believe there's a there's a date. I think it's like December, um, where there you can no longer purchase those long duration securities and pledge them in this facility. At least, could that change? Of course, it could. Um, but it doesn't. You know. You can't go load up in duration right now and then and then you know see a, a big drawdown and and not have take that risk. It's just for you know kind of the lag and and you know uh, all that all the securities purchased post you know in in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one essentially. Um, and so I, I think that's that's part of it. Uh, the rates market, the the, the stir market, short term interest rate market, is is pricing in a total pivot uh, across the board. Uh, at least uh, you know a. a a pause or a uh, kind of rejection of the higher for longer um, and saying, Hey, maybe they don't even hike this next March, uh, this next March meeting. Uh, and then they're going to hold, and then they're going to, they're going to cut, you know, 50 basis points, hundred basis points in 2024. Um, I think there's the potential with, with this facility in place, some, some regional bank consolidation, you know, the, the fortress banks aren't going to, aren't going to face these same worries. Um, at least I, I, I don't think so. Uh, that would be quite, quite the phenomenon if they did, but they don't have that much exposure to duration. And so I think this does, you know, if CPI continues to rip, the labor market's still super, super tight. 
core inflation is stickier than I think a lot of people would like to believe, it, even with this, uh, the lag effects of the tightening cycle underway. I, th- I, th- I think they like, you know, I'm not in the camp where they, I believe they go to the zero lower bound right away uh, and, and, you know, immediately have to turn the turn on the, the money spigot uh, in full force as they did post COVID, right? Maybe some bank, uh, you know, some bank liquidity uh, uh, dynamics to take care of, but the, the, the rates that are, you know, 4%, maybe 5%. I think there could be some repricing in the next couple of weeks here as, you know, we get the CPI print, as we get some more economic data that says, okay, now that we've had this banking scare, uh, I think, I think we could see this, this not, not as high as they thought for the higher for longer, uh, but the, the immediate knee jerk pivot reaction up only um, Fed capitulated might get walked back a bit. Um, and so that's, that's more for the, the short to intermediate time frame traders. Like for the Bitcoiners, and I, I'm sympathetic with this view because I'm partially in this camp. Like I have an active portfolio for more short term stuff. I also have a decade century hodl bag that I don't care about. You know what I mean? Like that I'm just accumulating Bitcoin because I know this end game. Um, so I certainly sympathize with that view of like, okay, who cares whether the next Fed meeting is 50 bips or 25 bips or zero bips? This, this, this train has no brakes. It's teetering off the rails. Has it teetered yet fully or not? Who knows, but it's coming. Uh, and, and the end game is as inevitable as it ever was. I certainly sympathize with that view as well. Uh, and tuning out all that noise and just stacking. Um, so, so yeah, totally. yeah, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, the two year had fallen off a cliff uh, this morning and, the market was recently giving like a over 60% probability of a 50 bips rate hike next FOMC meeting. And now it's like a 26% probability of no rate hike. And that happened in like days. <laughs> and now Goldman no longer even expects a rate hike either. So what about you, Joe? What do you think about like coming Fed policy? Um, do you think this is a bigger pivot that we just saw? Or, or do you think they're going to continue on their, their rate hiking path to combat inflation? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, frankly, it's going to be a lot harder for the Fed to effectively influence short-term rates now that it did what it just did. Um, the The idea behind it, I understand, because basically what they were doing, we saw the guilt scare back in September, um, <clears throat> you know, that threatened these, uh, these uh, liability-driven investment strategies. Um, and the BOE essentially stepped in to stabilize the bond market. Uh, I was talking to Michael Howell, sort of the foremost authority on global liquidity, really. And he said over the next decade, uh, central banks taking a more active role in their bond markets will be more important than ever, right? They will have to intervene and make sure that bond, the bond market is stable because it is the, the collateral that underlies the entire financial system. Uh, and, and little did I know a week and a half later that we would witness an event where the unrealized losses on these banks' balance sheets were just too much and the Fed had to intervene in some way. And so in a way, this is a method that the Fed can have their cake and eat it too, right? They can make sure that uh, uh, public confidence is, is is stable and banks have all of the uh, liquidity that they need and we don't witness a credit event, but it, all, and it also allows the hike. But by the same token, the market certainly doesn't believe that. Um, and if the rates market is in complete disagreement with you, um, you know, if the front end of the curve is uh, totally moving in the opposite direction, it's a lot harder to transmit your policy. Um Last week, when the Fed, or when the the uh, you know forward rate expectations were for fifty basis points in March, off the back of just a few hot economic prints, I was under the I thought that they were getting out ahead of their skis. Um, we wrote it in our newsletter at the time that markets were getting out ahead of their skis with writing with with saying that the Fed's going to reaccelerate because that would have sent the wrong message to markets, right? It would have sent the message to markets that inflation isn't under control. And what the Fed just did on Sunday was sending the wrong message to markets. It sent the message that we don't have tightening under control, right? Um, you know, the reason aggressive tightening worked all throughout last year was because the market said, oh, they're doing this for a reason, right? They, they know that the financial system is going to be stable if they do this. And uh, it, the Fed essentially just said on Sunday that, yeah, we, we didn't see this coming at all. We're stepping in with emergency actions, right? This wasn't expected. If it was expected, we wouldn't have done anything. But because we're doing something, it wasn't expected. And so now um, the way that the, uh, the curve is repricing is uh, completely accurate. Yesterday, um, twos were at 445. Now they're at 4%. 4%, 4.02. So a, a nearly 50 basis point drop in a single day. That is unreal. That is unheard of. We haven't seen that yet this cycle. We've seen it in the past, but we haven't seen it yet this cycle. 
And so the jury is in. It's never been more clear. Uh, the Fed, in all likelihood, it, it, I wouldn't say in my estimation yet, but it seems like um, they're done with hikes. It seems like we're here for a pause. Uh, for the longest time, the the reason that the Fed downshifted, in my purview, and in in the spoken Fed rhetoric, was so that they would have uh, more incremental tightening ability. Basically, all that means is that they'd be able to tighten at very very small increments for a longer period. And the question is, okay, why would you want to do that rather than just uh, arriving at your target and staying there? And the reason was, at the end of the day, they wanted to break something so that they would have a reason to pause, right? If nothing breaks, um, you know, if the economy is still running smoothly, if inflation is still hot, there's no reason to pause your hikes. And so essentially through incrementally tightening, the idea was that eventually we'll reach a point where this is totally untenable. And uh, I didn't think it would come so soon, but here we are. And so we've reached the point where the Fed's policy structure at the front end is untenable. The rates market is saying, yeah, you're done. It's fallen off a cliff. Uh, the two's Fed funds inversion is now the deepest it's been this cycle at negative 75 basis points, right? So the, the forward rate expectate, forward policy rate expectations are 75 basis points below the actual policy rate. I haven't taken a look at uh, my Bloomberg screen today that also does policy rate estimation, but I would say that um, it seems like the Fed is done. Um, at least for now, right? They may resume hikes at some point in the future, but it seems like we're in for an extended pause yeah. as a function of what just happened. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I feel like the one thing that kind of ties all this together is the idea of counterparty risk. Like we saw, we even saw Circle, like USDC, that's, uh, you know, quote unquote, the, the safest stable coin, you know, break the buck all the way down to like 82 cents or something. And, I mean, we saw a flood into Tether, which I thought was funny. I mean, has anybody had a harder time than Tether truthers trying to short Tether over the last year? <laughs> just watching all these things collapse around them and they're just in this expensive trade trying to short that thing. But, you know, counterparty risk, um, even with Circle, you, 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 you were like, where do they keep their reserves, right? What, what's, who's their banking partners? And all these corporations are asking the same thing. How do, we, how do we manage our treasuries? Like, how do we do corporate treasuries when there's, you know, now it's all backed 100%. But before yesterday, it was uh, everything over 250K was uninsured. And so it really shined a light on Bitcoin, right, as a counterparty risk asset. Um, and to me, when I ever see bailouts, I get bullish. I mean, I just, it's like reinforces the long-term reasons why I'm in this asset. Um, and so what's your guys' takeaways and just in terms of Bitcoin, how do you see it playing out? Maybe short, medium term to long term. Let's just finish with that. Dylan, what about you? The idea I've had for really, since it was clear in, in 22, early 22 was they're going to tighten until this thing hits, uh, hits the rails and teeters. Uh, until they blink, and it might even might even get materially worse until they have to blink twice, blink three times. Um, so I still kind of believe that uh, we're going to see a, somewhat of a probably a. I think we're getting a real sugar high right now. Uh, I think there's probably going to be at some point another moment of reckoning um, in the real economy. We're like, oh wow, we need this, but we're in a sustained inflationary regime. Uh, that the you know the forty year uh, bond equity bull market in real terms is. At least in bond, the, the the bull market in bonds in real terms is dead. Uh, in equities, I think we're in a you know period of of stagnation for a decade in real terms. In nominal terms, I think it's still up only because inflation's you know we're in a sustained regime. But that you know that forty year real return run that everyone got, where you know secular wealth is possible just by levering up to the hilt uh, and refinancing as rates go lower. I think that world is done. Uh, I think Bitcoin is uniquely suited to to rip faces in 2022. So the thesis hasn't really changed at all for me. Uh, and this, you know, this it's the last three, three days, five days has been probably the best narrative reinforcement we've seen in, in quite some time yeah. since the COVID COVID lows. So I'm pretty bullish. Yeah. Joe. It's remarkable how Bitcoin has no advertising department yet. We get these tremendous ads for owning Bitcoin every so often. You know, this is uh this is an instance of, uh, showing just how much the Fed really isn't in the driver's seat, showing how much this is really just uh, fugazi. None of it's really there. None of it's real. There is nobody with their hand on the steering wheel, though we all thought that there was. Um, you know, And it really goes to show, again, through the fact that this collateral that banks have been forced to hold, uh, they're now holding tens, hundreds, sometimes hundreds of billions of dollars worth of market market losses on their balance sheet, uh, and they're just holding those. If depositors 
you know, if there was mass suddenly tomorrow, mass financial literacy, and everybody understood what that meant and understood that the banks are broke in real terms, um, you know, they'd all go to the bank, they'd all rush to the bank, take their money out, and they'd be insolvent tomorrow. Um, but of course, that won't happen. It happens on these smaller, more bite sized scales with those regional banks. Um, and it's the, the big lesson in counterparty risk. So we had, uh, I, I think Dylan tweeted this out, he tweeted out twice. Um, you said, uh, you know, that counterparty. Uh, risk-free magic mo- internet ma- magic internet money makes a lot more sense. And then you tweet it out again. Um, you know that infinitely scarce, that absolutely scarce magic internet money makes a lot more sense. And within four days, we we witnessed both of those. Right, we witnessed the importance of your money is not really yours because three banks failed basically overnight. Uh, and then we witnessed that hey, the Fed. Remember, remember who is in charge of the money, right? People who are, are willing to just turn on the money printers, even though they're not really money printers, right? Um, you know, turn on the money printers at any time. Uh, and so it really makes sense to hold uh, a lot of your uh, portfolio if you believe that this is sort of the end game of the world financial system, where the Fed just becomes more and more involved until they are the only buyer uh, of US treasuries. And they are, uh, you know, the people who have to step in every single time uh, and ameliorate these banking crises. Um, if that is your assumption, then Bitcoin is the only asset that it really makes sense to have an outsized portion of your portfolio in. Um, you know, if the Fed needs to keep intervening over the next several years and several decades, which I believe is a surefire bet, then it's also a surefire uh, you know position that you should hold uh, Bitcoin as a significant portion of your portfolio. Hundred percent. Like when an investor holds Bitcoin in self custody, there's no person or entity they have to trust to gain access to those savings. You know, Bitcoin sound money. Can hold your own private keys. No trust is required, and you know it's it's been a the bear market's been pretty volatile. And um, but I hadn't felt as bullish as I have been in a long time. On Sunday, man, when I when I saw the lunacy of the global financial system and how interconnected it is and how fragile it is, Bitcoin's anti-fragile, and it benefits from from chaos. And and I've just never been as bullish as I am right now because it it re reaffirmed why. Um, I own Bitcoin is the lack of counterparty risk and and the scarcity and all those things that we know. Um, so, you know, guys, thanks for joining. Uh, this is a great conversation, uh, covered a lot. But um, where can people find you to learn more? Because like, I'm a big fan of both your guys' work. You guys do both great work, great writing. So where can people find you? Yeah, you can uh, appreciate you having us on, Sam. It's been a, been a great rip. Love talking with Joe. We've been coming together a lot recently. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dylan LeClaire underscore. Um, most of my stuff is there. Uh, we do some stuff with BitcoinMagazinePro.com. So you, we publish the research there. Um, it's been it's been fun. Thanks. For sure. Joe? Likewise, Dylan. Uh, Sam, thanks for having us on. Dylan, it's always great to work with you, man. Um, and uh, you could find my work uh, on the screen you see at Joe Consorti. You could also uh, Google that big neon sign behind me, the Bitcoin layer. Uh, go to the BitcoinLayer.com. You could read some of the more long form stuff there. Yep. I highly recommend both uh, your long form pieces. They're great. So thanks for coming on, guys. You have a great day and uh, keep stacking. Cheers. If you care about your financial future, you need to check out a couple of our offerings, including Swan IRA and Swan Private. Swan Private is our white glove concierge service where you get a trusted partner on your Bitcoin journey. We offer all kinds of education and research projects, as well as exclusive events to our Swan Private customers. Check it out today at swan.com slash private. Also, Swan IRA. Swan IRA is the best way to gain exposure to real Bitcoin in a tax advantage account, like a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, or rolling over your 401k. So if that interests you, check it out at swan.com slash IRA today.